Fire, man's oldest foe. There are a lot of themes that you can use to create a unique setting, no matter what type of game you're making. Last time we talked about winter levels, so now let's swing in the other direction, fire levels. Anything very hot and not a desert counts. Burning buildings, floors that are lava, underground foundries, star plasma, non-denominational hellscapes. If you don't want to touch it, it's fair game. Let's talk about what goes into making a great fire level. Watch out, I've unlocked a new ability. I can see into your mind. But only the math and science parts. So, don't worry. <laughs> uh, oh. Oh no. Those STEM classes you took in school look like faint embers. Some of them are so old they're about to go out. Don't let them die. Reignite your love of universal knowledge with today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant has put together thousands of amazing interactive lessons in math, science, engineering, and data analysis that take you step by step through concepts until you get the ideas locked in. I've gotten a couple of mini game ideas from seeing their lessons in action. They're useful tools for game designers not only for the lesson content, but for how they put the overall package together to get the lessons taught properly. You'll get some great tutorial ideas from these lessons. They're super quick too. They're easy to dip into your schedule whenever you have a minute free, no matter how busy you get. Brilliant can help you keep your grades up or just learn something useful for your daily life. They're posting new lessons every month. Try it out for 30 days for free at brilliant.org slash design doc. We've got a link in the description. The first 200 to sign up get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium plan. Thanks, Brilliant. Some stage tropes are friendlier than others. Candy stages? Rarely violent. Except this one. But fire is not that. Fire is a hazard, and fire stages most often set up player versus environment conflicts. Wait, not PvE, that's something else. Character versus nature is what I'm talking about. It's one of the main types of conflict in fiction, alongside character versus another character, versus society, versus technology, versus fate, versus themselves, and a couple others, depending on how finely you want to split hairs here. Character versus nature is where fire levels tend to live. Scorching flames and searing lava are pretty much ideally suited as environmental hazards. There's a variety too. Fireballs, flaming pillars, lava lakes. Fire areas present a distinct sense of danger to a game on demand and communicate that danger almost automatically. So what do you do if you want to think of a new fire level? First things first, the fire level's gonna need some fire to play around with, right? What would a fire level be without some fun fire mechanics? Almost every fire level that isn't just an aesthetic, so any fire level that tries to incorporate fire into the gameplay, revolves heavily around not touching it. Fire hurts. Fire burns. Fire destroys. Fire blocks your path. Fire is a barrier that must be dealt with before you can do something else. So if you don't want to touch the fire, how do you want to deal with it instead? Do you run from it? Torchman is responsible for burning up this forest in Mega Man 11. There are a lot of gimmicks here. Owl lantern robots that light up the room, metallic platforms that get superheated, and the most deadly of them all, inferno walls that instantly kill you on contact. The stage makes you deal with multiple do or die sequences with these walls. There's no water around. You can't blow it out. There's no negotiating with the firewall. All you can do is run. Don't trip over the other hazards along the way. Maybe you don't want to run away though. Some games do let you face the fire head on. Mighty Switch Force 2 is themed around firefighting, and your only weapon is a fire hose. Naturally, there are plenty of fires to douse along the way. The game is built around the unique interactions between your hose and the gimmicks in each stage. There are fires of different sizes you have to clear before getting anywhere, and blocks that you can only douse temporarily. The fire hose mechanic is so front and center that half the game's mechanics are about what else you can do when your only weapon is a fire hose. Melting away mud blocks, pushing enemies into traps. Just because they're firefighting tools, that doesn't mean you can't use them for other things. What if you use the fire a little more strategically? Some games use fire as a general purpose barrier to keep areas generally off limits, either permanently or for a time. Fire Emblem The Binding Blade had lava geysers that spout off randomly, dealing actually not that much damage all things considered to any unit standing on top of the tile. Fire Emblem Awakening uses a more permanent style of lava tile on some maps to do roughly the same thing. Really? Only 10 damage for standing on lava? I mean, it's kinda a lot, but it's lava. 
Have you ever stood on lava? Some games deal with what being close to fire would do to you, or to your inventory. Breath of the Wild's chemistry system causes the extreme heat of Death Mountain to limit you in a few ways, even after you figure out how to survive just being in the area with fireproof armor or elixirs. Many dropped materials burn up and turn to ash. Wooden weapons will instantly catch on fire and burn away. Arrows light up and bomb arrows explode the second you pull one out, which makes them very funny to use. It doesn't have to be all bad though. Fire can be used for good too. It's one of mankind's oldest tools. And when fire gets featured in a level as a tool, it tends to be less destructive. You get fire implementations with all upsides and no downsides. Like if you have a boomerang transferring fire from one place to another, it doesn't usually then burn up. All upside. Depending on your exact use case, you can pick and choose some of the properties of fire and ignore others as you see fit. A fire level can also be the environment against the fire. Some fire levels are about you trying to keep a flame lit at all costs. Breath of the Wild's Blue Flame Shrine is a puzzle about transferring a special blue flame across the shrine by any means necessary. You can light up torches, wooden weapons, arrows, any way you can think of moving the fire around will work. Avoid all the conveniently placed water spouts and make sure you get your timing right to set multiple torches on fire simultaneously and you'll get through it. The shrine is a test of your knowledge about the rules of fire in the game and is just a pleasant mini dungeon that I honestly wish the game had more of. Fire has been used for all time as a great light source, and that aspect of fire can work its way into games too. Some stages feature fire as the only illumination in a pitch black environment, and you have to carry torches or light fires to progress. World 2-3 in New Super Mario Bros. Wii is an underground stage where you have to navigate by the light around you. Your character emits a little light naturally, but you have to use whatever fire sources you find lying around to get further, whether it's lanterns, fireballs launched from piranha plants, or hopping potaboos. Incorporating the light source properties of fire into the game mechanics leads to being able to change other fundamental properties of the game, like how much you can see or how much you can plan. Taking out the enemies also takes out their light, so now you have to plan ahead to let the enemies do a job for you. Work around the limitations, and if you can find a fire flower, you can even create your own source of light. The one change opens up a unique set of rule tweaks that makes an otherwise basic stage much more memorable. Removing the light is not everyone's favorite type of stage gimmick, but it's just one possibility. Fire has also been used in the past as a source of safety. You can sometimes ward off danger by just being close to a flame. Nasty things spawn in the darkness, so it's up to you to make sure there isn't any of that around your campsite. Tons of survival games like Minecraft, Don't Starve, and Terraria make light from torches the primary way to keep the enemies that lurk in the shadows at bay. Do it right, and you'll have a much easier time keeping your stronghold safe and surviving the night. So those are some fun fire mechanics, but a fire level needs to feel like the heat is baked in so to speak. How can you make a stage feel like it's fundamentally about fire? If you're designing a fire stage, you probably want it to be more than just set dressing. The fiery nature of where you are should affect how you move through and think about the level. But what options do we have to make a fire theme affect how a level plays? Often, fire is used to bar access to some parts of a stage. Flame walls and hot floors could do that, but sometimes it's not so much the fire itself, but the heat that blocks your way through an area. Heat and temperature management can be used as mechanics in fire and volcanic landscapes to do a lot of things. Going into superheated areas can immediately do damage, like draining your health. You could have a temperature gauge and getting too hot can cause you to pass out or burst into flames. The heated room is often used as a major barrier. The way around it is some kind of heat shield, either an item that blocks it or a passive ability that keeps you cool. Various suits, Goron tunics, flame earrings, and fireproof elixirs. Now with your fantasy air conditioner, you can treat the room just like all the other ones. That works. Maybe it's a little bland though. It's like an abstracted lock and key puzzle. If you just get an ability or item that makes you immune to the heat, you stop having to deal with it, so that mechanic tends to become forgettable. But there are other ways to use fire and heat to reshape how you move through a level. The Luncheon Kingdom in Mario Odyssey is a totally unique spin on the traditional lava level entirely themed around low poly looking food. The lava here is the broth of a gigantic stew. It's still a lava level, 
the broth burns all the same, and there are plenty of fire-based enemies and torch puzzles to be found like any other. The game's capture mechanic comes into play as you take over enemies immune to the heat, like the lava bubble, which can swim in it no problem. It becomes a give-and-take version of the usual Mario traversal puzzles, where capturing flips you between traveling in and out of the lava. There are even sections where you want to spread out the broth with these little tomato guys so the lava bubbles can get to more places. The whole package winds up being more interesting than if you were just given an item to walk and swim anywhere you wanted. The indie metroidvania Haiku the Robot uses heated rooms to change how your moveset works. Normally, your special moves are tied to an overheat gauge to give a natural cap to how many times you get to use them in a row. If you go past the end of the gauge, you'll set yourself on fire and are locked out of your moves. Some rooms in the game are superheated. After you get a heat shield upgrade, you can enter them and walk around just like normal, but your overheat gauge is maxed out all the time while you're inside. You can't use specials until you leave, which changes how you move around and how precise you have to be with your platforming. Other games just don't have a good way for you to deal with the heat. Instead, you're supposed to get out of there. In stages like Freedom Planet 2's Magma Starscape, you'll be zooming around both inside and outside an active volcano. The interior areas are superheated and you won't be barred from entering them, but you're going to have to think harder about navigating while you're inside. With the heat mechanic, the stage becomes more about being quick and efficient with your movement in order to find cover in cooler areas quickly before you overheat and take damage. Or maybe you use radiating heat. Just don't get too close to the stove. In Star Fox 64, you can run a course through Solar, the sun of the Lilat system. Somehow, there's a good amount of life living in the molten surface, including the enemy's bioweapon, which you have to deal with for... some reason. Okay, the justification for Solar doesn't make a ton of sense, but you're here. Luckily, the R-Wing can take temperatures up to 9,000 degrees, so you're fine, as long as you don't hover too close to the surface. Flying through solar is an exercise in staying as far away from the ground as you can, as the heat of the sun will constantly tick down your ship's health, and much faster if you fly too low. Your teammates aren't immune either, which can be a problem pretty quick if they come into the stage with low health. But they're only actually getting hurt if they're talking to you. Weird. Solar is actually kind of a rare example of the heat of a location doing damage without you physically touching what's emanating the heat. Okay, we need some good gimmicks. What can we use for inspiration? Some fire stages are hiding a secret. If you scratch at the surface, they're actually water levels. Well, except if you try to touch the water, you'll get hurt. But otherwise, a lot of the same types of mechanics will show up in both fire and water stages. Rivers you have to redirect, levels to raise and drop, finding a safe platform to get across a flow, elemental puzzles but they're hot instead of wet, you can borrow a whole lot of mechanics from a water stage, tint them red and yellow, and paste them in there. Though lava isn't exactly like water of course, and if you mix fake water with real water, you can get some interesting results. Cooled magma acts as a platform a lot. We've already talked about Breath of the Wild's chemistry system modeling how items react in hot places, but Tears of the Kingdom added a few new rules to the mix. You can now create planks of cooled magma wherever you apply water whether it's from a magic opal gem or from an ancient zonai fire hydrant. Lava plus water equals platform isn't new, but now with the ultra hand mechanic, we can use that blank for evil. Glue them together to make hell bridges, hell cars, hell boats, or the world's worst s'more. Tears of the Kingdom is full of goofy puzzle solutions, and the lava in the game isn't left out of the party. So we've got fire mechanics and we've got fire levels. But fire isn't just about physical burning plasma, it's also about burning things metaphorically. It's a symbol. It's power, loss, and destruction. It's passion, rigor, and inspiration. Fire has been used in a narrative context roughly forever, and video games can do that too. Fire levels are, of course, often demon-filled hellscapes. The trope of a hellscape borrows a lot from Western religious symbolism involving eternal punishment, ultimate evil, and good old-fashioned Satan. It's not really how hell is actually described by those religions, but thanks to a wonky translation or two, fire has been used so often as the theme that it cemented itself in the popular consciousness as the media's canonical hell. Many games are made by people who share that storytelling background and heritage, so it makes sense for those tropes to bleed into gaming just as they have for literature and film. 
Your game doesn't have to have a religious antagonist. Any embodiment of the evil you're struggling against in the game can be depicted as living, thriving, or originating from there. Your job was always to defeat evil at its source. And what's a better place to show off that this area is only bad than for it to be a hellscape? The way that fire can embody an active danger makes it well suited for changing the tone of a situation. It's great at creating a sense of crisis if it's used to change an area you're already familiar with. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze's third world, Bright Savannah, starts as a charming and uplifting music-based stage with some very blatant Lion King inspirations. The place is a grassland, full of life. Now add fire. A few stages later, you reach 3-4, Scorch and Torch. A massive wildfire has broken out and you're traversing a savanna of singed plants and actively on fire porcupines. You use water fruits to extinguish flames in your way. The music also changes to reflect the desperation of the situation. Now there's not really a narrative through line here. Donkey Kong's not much for allegories or whatever, but the level's change is pretty striking. If you're looking for that narrative through line though, classic RPGs love to use fire as the destructive change of the narrative status quo especially at the beginning. There's a big bag full of games where the starting hometown or other early meaningful location comes under attack and is set ablaze. It's a shove in the back of the heroes to get going out on their journey and establishes both the big threat and the personal stakes for your player characters by just adding fire to one of the only places you've gotten to know so far. Sometimes this can show up a little later in a darkest hour type moment for the party, but the function is more or less the same. Mechanically, this doesn't have to do much. Maybe some light navigating around burning debris, but this fire level is all about the destructive potential for change that fire symbolizes. If you've got a burning question, let's talk in the comments. What are some of your favorite fire levels? And what mechanics and symbols do they use to really drive home the theme? You have no idea how much I had to fight to keep myself from mentioning every single Zelda game in this. Fire levels have no shortage of different aspects to theme themselves with. From fire as a primal force of nature, altering the landscape and destroying everything in its path, to fire as humanity's most fundamental tool, bringer of light and warmth to where there is none, to fire as a symbol of purity, energy, passion, and progress. Fire levels are an incredibly flexible trope and can forge exactly what a game needs.